Hi everyone and welcome to the Baubles and Bubbles for Better Bones fundraiser. I'm Melissa Bernardi, the Director of Development at the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, staff, and the estimated 50,000 men, women, and children in the U.S. who are living with OI, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. In the past year, we have been overwhelmed by supporters like yourself who have not let a global pandemic stop the amazing work of the OI Foundation. The unbreakable spirit of the OI community has kept us going, and we promise not to stop providing the OI community with medically verified information, opportunities for mutual support, and most importantly, research to find treatments for OI. Tonight is so special because not only are we being joined by former OIF Board of Directors member and Senior Vice President of the Sotheby's Jewelry Department, Robin Wright, to take us on a one-of-a-kind look at the magnificent jewels up for auction at Sotheby's in New York, but we have a unique opportunity to hear from several members of the OI community, all of whom have attended the Fine Wines New York City event in the past. Everyone who's joining us tonight has been entered to win our door prize raffle that we will draw throughout the evening. You must be present to win, so stick around. But most importantly, you're going to have the opportunity to raise your paddle and fund the mission of the OI Foundation, specifically the Jamie Kendall Fund for OI Adult Health. That's coming up a little later on, but at any point this evening, you can go to pledge.2 slash OIF Bobbles 2021 or use your phone to text Bobbles to 707070 to make a donation. We've also put it in the chat for you. So what do you say we get started? Without further ado, please welcome Robin Wright. Good evening, everyone. I'm Robin Wright. Uh, nice to have you here. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Melissa, and many, many of the other staff at the OIF that have made this possible, who've actually taken my kind of harebrained idea and actually made it a reality about baubles and bubbles for better bones and, and encompassing jewelry and the OI Foundation. Uh, the bobbleheads, as we'll call ourselves, or bubbleheads, whichever, since we're all in this together. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy everyone's here. I hope that you'll enjoy a little bit of a few stories about jewelry, some stories from OI members, uh, from OI Foundation members, also some stories from OI uh, community members uh, that will give you a little bit of idea about how OIF is helping and how we can continue to help and uh, the part that you can play in that. Uh, we're coming to you tonight from Sotheby's Auction House in New York, where I actually happen to work for the last 21 years. Uh, as Melissa spoke, I am a former board member from the OI Foundation, and I actually have a mild type of one, type one OI myself, uh, which has caused me to break about 30 bones. You know, fingers and toes don't count anymore, but uh, so I've broken lots of bones, but uh, even more that affected me than anything was I started losing my hearing when I was quite a young child, about eight years old. Um, since that time, there's been tremendous strides in hearing loss, in OI Foundation, uh, helping with uh, the research of helping all of us to, have, to build stronger bones and live longer. Thank goodness, uh, because when I began being involved with the OI Foundation, I was a little girl, about nine years old when I was diagnosed, uh, and they diagnosed me, you know, it was a very, very little known disease at that point, and we had just really started as a foundation about that time when Jim and Geisman and Rosalind James started on their kitchen table, uh, recognizing and printing out a, a, an OIF um, newsletter. Somehow, my mother had seen a... Uh, article in a magazine that Gemma had been part of and she said you know when I was diagnosed at age nine she was like I've got to find out about this and she found this article and we got involved at that time they were tremendously helpful in giving us information when we were kind of scared to death that made it sound really really bad when I was nine years old they told me I would never make it to the age of 30 because of tra you know a traumatic event uh, but I have to say I'm almost double 30 now and I'm still standing. So I think those are pretty good odds. So that's one of the things that we're working toward now tonight is to help adults with OI and also the Jamie Kendall Fund for cardio cardiopulmonary studies. 
uh, as we age, as many of us are, well, actually every one of us are, um, we're finding that we have, there are many, a host of other inform, uh, infirm, infirm things that happen to us, such as heart issues, eye issues, pulmonary issues, things like that. So we're, as we study more, as we are able to ex explore more, we're finding more help for everybody. Um, I appreciate having been in the OI Foundation and having been a former board member because I got to see the inside of what really happens in this wonderful organization. We've gone from someone's kitchen table to a virtually capable uh, group of people who can actually still function in a time of pandemic. So thank you for joining me. Uh, as I say, we're coming, we're coming to you tonight from the exhibition of the Magnificent Jewels auction, which will happen in Thursday at Sotheby's. Uh, I've been an auction uh, house employee, a jewelry specialist for 21 years now. Next week, be 21 years. And I've seen some of the most wonderful jewelry in the world, absolutely hands down. And I have seen a lot of crap. But the beautiful things end up here. Uh, and uh, tonight I wanna show you a few of those things. And some of you have been probably looking at what I'm wearing. And I'd like to show you first something that is be precious to all of you is this, an array of snowflakes. Snowflakes are important to, o, to us OIers. They're kind of an unofficial symbol for our malady. Um, we manifest in very different ways, just like every, every snowflake is different. Every one of our, us OIers manifests, manifests their disease in a different way. Not only that, but as one, we're fragile, but with many, we're an avalanche. And that avalanche can do and will do anything that can be done. I like to say, my motto is, oh, I can. And I think that we're some of the, you know, I don't wanna brag, but I think we're some of the coolest people on the planet uh, and have overcome things that other people have never even thought about and still come out with a smile and a bit of sarcasm and a, and a way to go forward. So thank you everybody. That's my little explanation about my, my journey with OI. And now let's see some jewels. So like I say, these snowflakes are all gold and diamonds by Van Cleef and Arpels, all from around the 1960s to 1970s. And these are actually not all from one collection. Uh, most of them are from one collection, but the earrings and the smaller brooch here are from a separate collection. The larger snowflakes are from the collection of Michelle Smith, whose estate we're selling. Uh, and these are all done by Van Cleef in about the 1960s and 1970s. The ear clips are Van Cleef as well. And that's something that's kind of special to all of us. Uh, now who doesn't need to wear like eight or nine snowflakes at a time, but they feel pretty good. And then also from Michelle Smith's collection are these two, I like to call them Wonder Woman cuffs. These are 18 karat gold Etruscan type gold cuffs. They're made by Van Cleef and Arpels. And they were made you know, early in the 60s and 70s mostly. They, they, we still see them around sometimes, but they were actually made in a mo in Etruscan motif to make them look old, but they were, they were new at that time. This particular pair of cuffs is very similar to a pair of cuffs that Jackie O wore. Famously, she wore them quite a bit. Uh, we sold Jackie O's estate in 1996, and this pair of, not this exact pair, but a similar pair of cuffs with the Jackie O factor sold for like $140,000 against an estimate of maybe $20,000. So there was a lot of Jackie factor in these bracelets, but we do see them come up to auction from time to time now still, and we just happen to have a pair this time, which makes them even more rare. They kind of make me feel powerful, like, like, uh, Jackie O would have, and Mrs. Smith, she was a powerful philanthropist and uh, collector and had a fabulous eye and has fabulous collection of um, design, uh, 20th century design and jewelry, which we'll be selling in the next couple of weeks. So that is my first turn of who are you wearing? And so I think that we have a cameo appearance, don't we, Melissa? We do. Thank you so Thank much, you Robin. Guys. Those pieces are amazing. And if any of you have any questions for Robin about any of the pieces you see tonight, you can feel free to write them in the chat and Robin will answer them at the end of the evening. We'll be back to see a few more in a moment, but I wanted to pause very quickly to hear from a very special young lady. 
Jaden Sachs is a 17 year old living with OI. Not only was her father Ian previously on the OIF board of directors, board of directors and her mother Wendy currently on our board, but Jaden herself is a very active member of the OI community who has led several very successful fundraisers for the OIF from swimathons to bake sales. So let's all welcome Jaden Sachs. Hi. My name is Jaden Sachs, I'm 17 years old, and I was diagnosed with type 1 of OI when I was 5 years old. I, first, I just want to thank Robin for hosting this amazing um, event tonight and for all your support to both me and for the OI Foundation over the past several years. Thank you so much. Um, the OI Foundation has been there um, to support me and my family since day one, whether it was providing advice, guidance, or just support. Um, they have given us amazing access to amazing doctors that me and my family will forever be grateful for. Um, in addition, I've had the opportunity to participate in several research studies that the OI Foundation and, the and other doctors have conducted. Um, however, um, although amazing research is being done, there is still much, much more research to do to improve the treatment for OI patients every single day. I really encourage you to donate if you can to help us fund and continue those amazing research efforts. In addition, I know that the OI Foundation will be there to support me for the rest of my life. My dream is to become an orthopedic surgeon, to help um, people just like me, and to give back to a community that has given me so much. And I know that the OI Foundation will be right by my side throughout the entire way. Thank you so much for joining the Zoom tonight. Um, please consider donating to the OI Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Jaden. Robin, what do you think? Can you tell us about a few more of those magnificent jewels? And again, if anyone has any follow-up questions, you can put them in the chat and Robin will answer them at the end of the evening. Hmm, let's see if there's more jewels. I just happen to have a few more. Uh, another thing that I'm wearing that you may have noticed as I was showing my hand, this is a wonderful diamond ring, 22.11 carats emerald cut diamond from the collection of Mrs. Patricia Wallace. Patricia Wallace was a Miami show-stopping redhead with a really great style and a verve and a real passion for philanthropy. Uh, Patricia was very, very famous for supporting a lot of animal rights and animal, pres animal preservation um, foundations. Uh, she founded a paw parazzi event, a charity event each year, which I'm sure she probably did wear this ring because it is a showstopper. Uh, and so she founded that, that uh, foundation uh, to help with the animal rights, but she was also a very, 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 very big supporter of research and protection of the big cats around the world. Leopards and panthers and snow leopards and cheetahs and all of the big cats that you think of in, on the safari or in a jungle or on National Geographic TV. Uh, she was in, in very much part of uh, helping with the research and the, and, the, and the keeping of those animals. And she, get, she, and she didn't just put her money where her mouth was, or she just didn't talk about it. She really put her money where her mouth was because she would even buy wonderful jewels such as this. Can you see this clearly? This is a beautiful sinewy 18 karat gold colored stone and diamond bracelet by Cartier. In the center, you'll see this span of ruby, sapphires, and emeralds, and then the diamond set uh, uh, panther in the center. This is a favorite piece, uh, and it, uh, one of the pieces that just really embodies her love of the animals. Uh, there are actually three pieces in our auction, uh, David Webb double, um, double tiger bangle, and two Cartier panther necklace and earring sets that are being sold to benefit the Pantera Foundation, which she was very, very uh, uh, involved in and uh, is now donating, donating the proceeds from the sale to that. So another wonderful woman, another uh, strong woman who had wonderful taste. So there's more to come. Thank you again, Robin. Before we move on, um, I think we need to do a raffle. What do you think? Yeah, let's do. Okay, so spin our wheel here. And congratulations to Carol Elkin. You have won a wine tasting for 20 at Total Wine and More. Oh, Carol Elkins lives in Sonoma. <laughs> That'll oh. come in handy. 
Hi, Carol. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry, we'll be back with another raffle a little later on. Uh, right now, I want to introduce another member of our OI family. He is an OI spouse and father. Please welcome Michael LaGuercio. Uh, I'm a father of a family who has OI. I don't have OI myself. Uh, my wife and my two kids have it. And I'm here today to ask you to donate to uh, the OI Foundation through this fundraiser that we're having tonight. The OI Foundation has been really helpful to us as a family. One of the first things that I did when we found out that my daughter had OI, I was doing a lot of research and I came upon the OI Foundation. They were able to give me a doctor to evaluate Ju uh, my daughter, Julia. And uh, they gave me Dr. Shapiro. So we went down to Baltimore and uh, she got evaluated. And one of the first things I said to Dr. Shapiro, I go, she was, basically two at the time, still not, didn't have any inkling of walking at all at that point. I said, Dr. Shapiro, uh, you know, will she walk? And he goes, Mike, he goes, don't worry about it. She will uh, be walking and she will be fine. So uh, again, the OI Foundation uh, really helped me out with that. They gave, Dr. Shapiro gave me good direction on uh, what we were gonna need to do with Julia growing up. And at that time, my wife was pregnant with uh, my son, Michael, who. Uh, also had later on. Julia had a break with the uh, her FEMA. She broke a FEMA. Devastating break for us. Again, the OI went to the OI Foundation. They helped us out. Uh, put us in touch with Dr. Raggio. Now, Dr. Raggio is a little closer. She's in New York City, about an hour from my house. And uh, she was fabulous. She really saved us. She said, listen, she goes, why don't we take the cast off, put a brace on. And it was fabulous. The brace is fabulous. As Julia got stronger, we were able to take the uh, pieces of the braces off. So eventually the whole brace came off. Uh, one of the big problems is, uh, I'm not sure if people know, is that once you have a break after the cast comes off, whatever you broke is kind of is kind of weaker. So that was one of the things that Dr. Raggio was able to show us that uh, you're gonna have to watch them carefully after the cast come off and put some type of brace on or, or something like that, just until they get stronger. So she was very innovative with that and she really helped us out. But the OI Foundation, again, uh, I'm asking you to, to see if you could donate uh, as much as you can uh, because it's a big family, the OI Foundation. Uh, we've been to this uh, Sotheby's event before. Uh, we had a great time there. Uh, also other events that they have. Uh, and we are able to meet people with, who are going through the same thing that we're going through. And it's nice to get this different perspective on, you know, how they handle the situation. Again, the OI Foundation was a great resource for us. And uh, so your donations will go to, you know, are going, are helping people like us. The kids are growing up now. Julia is, I'm very proud of her. She's going to graduate school to become a teacher. My son, Michael, he's going to Carnegie Mellon and he's majoring in uh, music composition. It's an exciting time for us. Uh, and I'm sure whatever, you know, the future holds for my children, uh, hopefully, it, you know, they will be safe. And I'm sure the OI Foundation will be behind us uh, whenever we need them. Thank you, Michael, so much for sharing your experience. As a mother myself, I know how consuming it is to worry about your children, not only as kids who may break their bones easily, but as they grow into adults and not knowing what their future may hold. And as you said, the OI Foundation is here for you through it all. So Robin, on that note, what do you think about showing us a few more of those magnificent jewels? Okay. Okay, let's see. Have another kind of cool piece. I don't know if any of you have ever actually carried an all gold purse with diamonds on it. It's heavy. It's really heavy. This belonged to the uh, this um, actress, Rhonda Fleming. You can see Rhonda here in the, in the diamonds. Rhonda Fleming, another redhead. And shout out to all the gingers in this sale. We've had so many collections from redheads. I guess they just have great taste. But anyway, Rhonda Fleming was another really beautiful red-headed actress in Hollywood. Uh, one of her most famous parts was in Spellbound by Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, she had brilliant red hair and bright green eyes and she really did favor emeralds. She loved emeralds because she thought that they 
played off her green eyes and her red hair. Rhonda would have carried this, I'm sure, you know, probably to Piggly Wiggly like I would. Uh, but uh, it's, this is a solid gold purse with a gold weave and the diamonds. The name Rhonda kind of has a special meaning to me because it was kind of an alter ego that a college friend of mine and I had, my name being Robin, her name being Tracy, and we were Rhonda and Trixie. Now, Rhonda, Robin Rhonda would have never had a bag like this. Uh, but now, these bags are actually quite collector's pieces. And this one in particular, I've attested, is big enough to carry your cell phone and all of the things that are modern, like your breath mints, and of course, hand sanitizer now. So these things still can come in handy and you can be very classy and carrying your mask. So thank you, Rhonda Fleming, for setting us up and having such great taste in jewels. She was actually really uh, one of the people at that era that actually wore some of the, the, the jewel, their jewels, their own jewels in the movies. Back then, people, they didn't lend, uh, how, uh, jewelry houses didn't lend their um, jewelry to, to actresses. But many of those in the 40s, 50s, and 60s did actually wear their own jewels. I don't remember seeing her in, in anything with her own jewels, but you can imagine she probably carried this on set. And then kind of switching gears a little bit to a different era, but still kind of movie oriented, is this beautiful Egyptian revival necklace, which just makes me think of Cleopatra and uh, Elizabeth Taylor and some of the wonderful films that have been uh, filmed throughout the years. This necklace is actually from about 1960s. It's much more modern than a usual architectural revival. Uh, the, the architectural revival pieces were really more toward the turn of the century, turn, turn of the 20th century. Um, and in, even later into uh, the time when King Tut's tomb was discovered. And, and that really set off a wave of Egypt, Egyptomania which this would have been very, very indicative of. You can see up close all the different little tablets of coral and lapis and turquoise. Uh, that would have been indicative of the colors of, the, of uh, Egyptomania. Um, and so when King Tut's tomb was uh, discovered, it was all things Egypt for many, many years. And then again, when King Tut's tomb started touring the country, it toured from 1961 to 1966 in the United States and Canada, then there was another resurgence as well, and that was the time that this necklace would have been made. You can see this is very, very supple, and it's heavy, very supple, and the workmanship is just amazing. But the cool thing is, is you can actually wear it on the other side as well. It's engraved with a very fine engraving. I'm not sure if you can see this but a very fine engraving on the back. So you could wear this for day wear to the grocery store. And then you could wear this in the evening with your little black dress. So you can see that the jewels that we have in this sale run the gamut from very old. We have Art Deco, we have every era, we have famous makers, we have famous people, but we have a lot of people that aren't famous that just had really great taste. Uh, I wish I could share with you every single piece because as you can imagine, every piece of jewelry has a story. Jewelry is very emotional. There's always nostalgia attached to it. So, and we get to hear all those stories, good or bad, sometimes ad nauseum. But uh, it, is, it is wonderful to hear some stories and see some things from uh, bygone eras and people that might be familiar to you, or at least to see some beautiful things that we really haven't gotten to see a lot of in the last year. So I hope you enjoy the jewels. I'm happy to take questions at the end of the um, at the end of the session. If you have questions about anything, my experience with OI, the jewelry, whatever. But thank you very much for listening to the jewel spiel. And now we'll go on to back to Melissa. Thank you so much, Robin. That's truly an amazing collection. Uh, remember, everyone, if you have any questions about these pieces, as Robin said, you can put them in the chat, and we'll address them at the end of tonight. Uh, before we move on to our next cameo, I think we can do another raffle. So let's go ahead and bring up our wheel. And 
ever think uh, you have won a gift card to amazon.com. So congratulations. All right. Now I want to introduce a former OIF board of directors member and adult living with OI from Connecticut, Michelle Dupre. Good evening. My name is Michelle Dupre, and I'm a past OI Foundation board member and community member. I'm here tonight to welcome you to this great event, the behind the scenes look at Sotheby's. As you could see from the opening photo, a few years ago, I had my own behind the scenes look at Sotheby's and got to try on that fabulous tiara. Um, I'm so thankful for that opportunity, and hopefully we will all be back doing things in person real soon. I'd like to welcome you and thank you from the bottom of my heart for your contributions to the OI Foundation, the OI Adult Health Initiative, and particularly the Jamie Kendall Fund. Um, a... The Jamie Kendall Fund has allowed the OI Foundation to lead in a landmark study of OI pulmonary function. And that was initiated through the Hospital of Special Surgery, which is very close to Sotheby's and uh, the leader there, Dr. Raggio. It's programs like these that help OIers like myself uh, live successfully as adults. The information gleaned from these studies bring new light in how we can care for and live a long, healthy life. It's one thing to get through the broken bones, which everybody knows about in uh, OI, but it's a whole different thing to lead a successful and productive life well into old age, and that your contributions today can help get us all into our old age successfully and happily. So thank you so much for being here and participating and contributing. And for any OIers out there, please get your COVID shot. I'll Thank you, thank you, thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you so much, Michelle. It has been a little over five years since Jamie Kendall passed away, and we've accomplished so much thanks to all of you. For the past five years, the money raised at events such as this one has allowed the amazing team of OIF Medical Advisory Council members, Dr. Kathleen Raggio from Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City, and Dr. Robert Sandhouse of the National Jewish Health in Colorado, who's also joining us here tonight, hi, Dr. Sandhouse, to study respiratory issues in the OI community. And their findings have been quite astounding. We've learned that all types of OI, regardless of type or severity, have bronchial wall thickening. This knowledge has been vital, especially in the past year, as we navigate COVID-19, possible complications, and whether or not people with OI should be considered in the high risk category to get a vaccine early. Our amazing investigators have not skipped a beat during the pandemic. They have continued to gather data and are preparing to begin the next phase of their study, which is to bring back all the individuals who participated in the study to get bronchoscopies, to see if they can get to the root cause of the lung complications that affect members of the OI community. And now why is this so important? Because once a commonality is discovered, the OI Foundation and our Medical Advisory Council members can establish a standard of care to have OI included on those vital lists of high risk disorders, as well as to have cardio function tests as part of a standard of care for everyone with OI, and to generate interest from pharma companies to find treatments and to save lives. I'll say that again, simply put, research being funded by the OI Foundation is saving lives. Unfortunately, research and medical procedures are expensive. On average, a single bronchoscopy costs $5,000, and that doesn't even cover the cost of bringing study participants to the hospitals in New York or Colorado. In an ideal world, we'd be able to bring all 30 study participants in for their bronchoscopies, which would cost $150,000. 
We won't be able to do it all at once, but through events such as this one, we will make it happen. On that note, I'm going to pass it back to Robin to get us started with the most important part of our evening, the Fund the Mission paddle raise to raise money for the Jamie Kendall Fund for OI Adult Health. Before the event, you are each sent a paddle with a bidder number. Hopefully you either printed it out or wrote your bidder number on a piece of paper in dark marker. If you don't know your bidder number, that's not a problem. You can write down your name and hold it up. After you raise your paddle, you can go to pledge.2 slash OIF Bobbles 2021 or use your phone to text Bobbles to 707070 to make a donation. We've put the, uh, the link in the chat for you. Because this is 2021, we also have a QR code. Just scan this code and your phone will take you straight to the donation page. Now I know many of you get a little nervous when you hear the words Sotheby's and auction in the same sentence and have a tendency to sit on your paddle to make sure you don't accidentally go home with a $4.5 million diamond. But in tonight's case, raising that paddle is doing something good. You are helping to fund the mission of the OI Foundation and you are improving lives. So Robin, what do you say we get started? You guys ready? Thanks for being here. I hope this is, you'll support us and I'll start out and with the Alyssa, happy we, do. We are doing great. I'm waiting for our, oh, we're at 13,150 right now. So thank oh, you guys so, so much for your wonderful pledges. We, uh, I'm just blown away by your generosity tonight. Gosh. Thank you. Um, thank remember you. you can continue to, um, if you want to pay your pledges or if you wanted to go ahead and make a donation without raising your paddle, you can go to pledge.2 slash OIF baubles 2021, or use your phone to text baubles to 707070 or scan the QR code that I'll leave up on my screen. Um, while, those, while those donations are still coming through, why don't we take a look at some of the questions we've had tonight for Robin? Okay, they're gonna cost you. Oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> One question we had was originally, where did Mrs. Smith, that's the, is that who had the ring? Uh, where would you purchase a 22 carat diamond ring? Uh, that was Mrs. Wallace, and you could purchase a 22 karat diamond ring at any really expensive jewelry store. <laughs> well, no, actually, that's not true. It's, it would be very unusual to find a 22 karat diamond in any jewelry store. Um, I worked in retail for 20 years before I came to, to auction, and the biggest diamond I ever sold was two carats. This is 10 times as big. So uh, this particular one is by Bulgari. So you could get this at Bulgari, you could get it at get it at an auction, you could get it at some of the bigger jewelry houses across the world, better names such as uh, Graf and Tiffany and Van Cleef and Arpels uh, and a, a lot of uh, diamond stone dealers as far as that's concerned. So they're out there, but something this big is doesn't come to the market very often. Is there, I, it's funny, I was looking at the um, exhibit online and my husband walked in and said, why are you looking at a 41 carat diamond? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a nice one. 41 and a half carat round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, birthday coming is, there, is there an interesting story behind the 22 carat diamond? I don't know that actually. We didn't, we didn't receive the story that. I, I don't imagine it was probably an engagement ring. Probably this was not the starter ring. Probably this was an upgrade. <laughs> Uh, later in life. Fair enough. So another question we had is how does the auction at work at Sotheby's? Do people get a preview of the jewels in person? Um, is it all virtual? How does that usually work? Right now we are having public view uh, by appointment only. Uh, this is one of the few sales that are we are having public view. Uh, we're getting more and more of them as we get the capacity opening up in the building. But we do have a live view running through tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock of all the jewels. There's about 400, pe uh, 400 pieces of jewelry. There's probably about, I don't know, $40 million worth of jewelry. Uh, and you can come in and you can browse through it and try it on and take a picture and Instagram it. And uh, it's a great way to spend an afternoon. And not only do we have jewelry, but we'll all also have the design uh, element of the, the Michelle Smith sale. It's so the 20th century design, the furniture and the sculpture and things like that. There's always something to see. 
So we had a follow-up about the Mrs. Wallace ring. You can tell this is a big hit, right? <laughs> <laughs> what year did Mrs. Wallace buy the ring or get the ring? Uh, you know what? That I don't know either. I would imagine all of her jewelry was purchased within the last probably 30 years. So again, it, I don't know the exact time that it was purchased, but it was probably not in her early collecting years. It's probably later in her years. Interesting. Another question we had is, how did you get, how long have you been at Sotheby's and how did you get your start from oh retail goodness. to Sotheby's? Oh my goodness. That's, that's a wild story. Um, I have been at Sotheby's 21 years uh, in the jewelry department the entire time. Before that, I was in retail jewelry in Arkansas, where I grew up, and in Colorado, which is my second home. Uh, but I actually started, <laughs> funnily enough, behind a Walmart jewelry counter in Arkansas, where I grew up. I pierced ears, I engraved sterling silver uh, ankle bracelets, I sold cheap, cheap, cheap costume jewelry, and teeny, teeny, tiny little, we call them canardly diamonds, because you can hardly see them at all, the teeny, tiny diamonds, and that's where I got my start, and I knew that I loved jewelry, uh, and so I got a degree in geology in college and worked in the oil business for a couple of years and really hated it. And I always loved jewelry and the stone part of my geology. So I was working in a jewelry store at night, working the, as a geologist in the day, working at a jewelry store at night. And when I finally decided that I didn't want to be in a geologist, I went back to jewelry, worked my way in through retail for 20 years, and then moved to New York 22 years ago with a company I was working for in Denver. Uh, and then subsequently got laid off four months later, but I wanted to stay and I hit the streets. I wanted to stay in New York. I hit the streets and oddly enough, ended up at Sotheby's as the manager of the vault, the jewelry vault. Uh, then I got my gemology degree and just touched every piece of jewelry that I could and learned the front, the back, the inside, outside, learned the marks, learned how they're manufactured, learned the makers, learned the styles, all of that stuff. And I have some of the greatest teachers and most, most brilliant colleagues in the world that have helped me along the way. And that's where I got where I am. That's that awesome. hard work, lots and lots of hard work. <laughs> I know that you spend a lot of your year, usually when we're not all locked down, uh, traveling to different mm -hmm. uh, people who might have a piece to sell. Um, and I love hearing those stories whenever you and I talk. Um, what is one of your favorite stories? Uh, there's so many of them that I, there's that. so many of them that I can't tell because of being, <laughs> de, being discreet, but I've had a little bit of everything happen to me, uh, out on the road. Um, but some of the, but even in the piece, some of the pieces that come into the office are pretty fabulous. I can remember about 10 or 12 years ago, uh, we had a walk-in and they called him from the lobby and said, Robin, there's somebody here that wants to show you a necklace. And I'm like, oh, really? It's Friday afternoon and I'm ready to go. But so they came up and it was the sweetest, most wonderful couple. They came up and they, we sat down and they had this envelope, you know, this like padded velvet envelope and they slid it across the table to me. And I opened up the first flap and this diamond chain fell out. It's like, oh, they opened up the second flap and there was more diamonds in the third flap. And it was this huge, so Twa from Cartier back from 1927. Uh, come to find out they were from a very famous family. I had no idea. Uh, and very humble and gracious and grateful of my help. Uh, that necklace was worth $750,000, just kept walking in off the street. And it sold for a million point four. And that, that family was in the auction room and every time the bid would go up another hundred thousand dollars she would squeeze his hand and he'd, he'd wince because she was squeezing hard and it was a really really precious time and I, I love seeing things like that going from one storied family to the next person that's part of the favorite part of my job that's fantastic so what is the most expensive piece of jewelry you've sold <laughs> that would be a uh 39 carat pink diamond that sold for $73 million in Hong Kong. 
uh, I happened to be there for that auction. I was in Hong Kong for that auction. It was being sold in Hong Kong, but I was over there with the highlights from the New York jewel sale. Uh, and that was the most expensive piece that I'd ever seen and I have ever touched. It was the size of a goose egg and it was pink, which is much, much more, ex it was easily, it was bigger than this, almost twice as big actually. And it was, uh, uh, it's over $73 million. And one of the things I can remember most about it is a very um, well-known client in Hong Kong came in with his three-year-old granddaughter. And he, the granddaughter was sitting on his shoulders and he took this $73 million diamond and handed it to her and she put it on her finger. And I was like, no, <laughs> but she didn't drop it. <laughs> Thank God. But yeah, that was the most expensive piece I've ever handled. Wow. And it looked good on me. <laughs> well, I think that's all the questions we've had tonight. Um, Robin, I want to thank you so much for your time, for doing this, for giving us this extra special glimpse of your world and the world of these magnificent jewels. So thank you so much. And thank you to Sotheby's for allowing us to get this little behind the scenes tour. Oh, and I wanted to thank just on behalf of myself and our board of directors and the 50,000 men, women, and children in the U.S. with OI. I just want to thank you all so much for being here tonight, for bidding, for pledging. Thank you all so much and have a good night. Thank you guys. You've made a difference to all of you that I know and those that I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Melissa and the OI Foundation for pulling this together when I never would have been able to do it myself. Thank well, you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. The beauty of the virtual world, right? <laughs> That's right, exactly. Thanks again. You guys have a good night. All right, good night, everyone. Thank you.